something that um, God has probably put on my heart a bit in the last week is the area that, one thing that I've discovered in God, when he wants to do something out there, he does something first in here. Um, it always happens in the beginning in the church. And whatever he's doing, um, you will find that he will begin it here. And uh, not the Burdekin, it would be great if he did, but I mean the church. So the church globally, God will start to do things and address things. One of the areas that I think that he wants to do is something I want to talk about this afternoon. But one thing that I've realized in my life is that at the end of my life, the result of everything that I am is not because of my genetic code or my postcode. Everything that I am is a result of decisions that I make in my life. Decisions, whether they're good or bad, they're always going to be the thing that dictate my life. I can make a good decision about my career. I can make a poor decision. I can choose to go to university and study, or I don't. And if I don't, I bear the consequence of not studying. Whether I'm happy to not study, that's irrelevant, but that's what I choose. If I choose to study and get better grades and all that sort of stuff, there's a decision that I've made that will affect down the path. So it all comes into play. Um, as a, I was a young man who thought that school, and made a decision that school was a waste of time, and it was purely for a social input into my life. As an older man, I'm beginning to realize that, hmm, maybe if I'd have disciplined myself and made some better choices, I may think differently today about studying. Now, as an older man who is studying, I'm going, you know what I battle every day? This is a waste of time. I'm 56. Why should I be doing this? But I make myself do it. If I'd have done it when I was 12, 13, 15, 18, maybe today it wouldn't be so hard. But I made a decision. And today, I am a result of that decision. Yeah? So whatever decisions you make, wherever you are today, most of it will be a result of decisions that you made. My dad made a decision a long time ago, and I'll talk a little bit about towards the end of this message, about a decision that he made that affected my life. He made a decision that changed my life forever. And I want to uh, talk about in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6 now, it says this. It says, he will restore, they're talking about God. It's the very last words that God says to the children of Israel. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. The very last thing that God says to the children of Israel is, I will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children. Some of the NIV, I think the new NIV now says, uh, parents to children. Um, but that's okay, we get it. They're just trying to keep it so everybody understands it. But the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. That I will not come and smite the land without a, with a curse. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I could safely say that you and I probably can look across the, 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 our cities and towns and regions right now and say that there has been definitely a societal breakdown in our nation. We have never seen such juvenile heights of juvenile crime that we're seeing today. It's not that it wasn't around when you were young. Some of you who are really old now. It was around. You young little whippersnappers, you were causing trouble amongst the, the people out there. But today, agreed that we are seeing a heightened degree of juvenile crime within our societies, communities. I know the Indigenous community is facing a huge... Uh, a wave of how do we handle this with our children and I know that the white community is also facing the same issue how do we handle this and so the Bible comes back and says this that there will be unless I smite the land with a curse and so what we're seeing now is a decision where parents and fathers are, have become absent for so long that now the curse that we're, I believe we're seeing something where the earth is going, we don't know. Because it doesn't matter what nation we go to, we are seeing this heightened rise of young people 
being, being destructive in their nations. It's everywhere. And it simply goes without saying that we do have this breakdown between parents and kids. And the Bible puts it as fathers to children. And it's the last thing God says for 400 years. The last thing. He gives them 400 years to fix it. And they don't. 400 years later, he appears and he goes, okay, Luke chapter 3, here's how you do it. Jesus appears in Luke chapter 3 and he goes down, I'm going to read it in a minute, and he goes down, but let's just go back for this 400 years. Can you just imagine being the children of Israel who have heard God through prophets, uh, physically, audibly heard him, and then all of a sudden he says this and it stops. Nothing. Nada. I don't know if you've ever had a cold shoulder. Let me rephrase the question this way. Have you ever been married? You'll know what a cold shoulder is. You'll either know what it is or you know how to give it. But there it was. Can you imagine what it was like? Just nothing, silence, until Luke chapter 3 came and gone and God gave us the 400 years to get it right and we didn't. Fathers and their children, brokenness and pain always follows, doesn't it? Anytime I talk to somebody, I, I can talk at work, at church, anywhere I talk, people will say, you'll start talking to them, and all of a sudden, somewhere in the conversation, it will come up about their relationship with their father or their parents, how it wasn't good or it was good. It doesn't matter where it is, but it will boil back down to, and you know the really interesting thing, I reckon if I dug down to it, if somebody was to tell me they had a really bad relationship with their father or their parents, I'll guarantee if I met their parents, I would ask them similar questions and I would get back to that they had a bad relationship, something went wrong in that relationship and then if I keep going and I keep going and I keep going. And I am very aware that this topic is a really hard topic to think about for some. While for others, it'll be, I had the best relationship with my dad ever. But for some people, it'll be a really hard thing. But I will say again, I believe that God starts to do things in the church before he starts to do things outside the church. That he restores the things that are broken. Fathers and children. A lot of conversations, as I said, I see that. Psychologists say today here in Australia that only 10% of children have a relationship with their father, a good relationship. 10% of the children in our nation have a good relationship with their father. Wow. Ten, think about this. Ten percent. Folks, it's a big deal. This is a big deal. And I believe that God is wanting to restore something in this relationship. I heard a story once of a gentleman I was reading in a book and he said, he said this, he was talking to another friend who was writing a book about fathers and he was talking to him and he said if you as he got talking he said I've got this really bad relationship and I find it really hard with God and he said so what if you have a bad relationship how do you talk to the father and he says well I don't I talk to Jesus and I hope that Jesus takes it to the father and he said it sounds funny but he said but I stepped back from that thought and he went something's wrong with me because I can't talk to the father there's nothing really theologically wrong with that because Jesus is our intercessor he just had this picture, I'll talk to Jesus and Jesus will go and talk to the boss about the situation. And a lot of us are like that and as I said, the crime rate is going through and it's all with young people. We're seeing younger people everywhere and God, again, I come back, he gave us 400 years, we didn't get it. Then Jesus appears and gets baptised by John the Baptist and in Luke three twenty one, he says this, Now when all the people were baptised, Jesus also was baptised. And while he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the father again gives us 400 years to get it right and we didn't so he said, you know what, I'm going to come down and I'm going to show you how to do it. Here's a spot in the Bible where the Trinity exists on earth in one moment, the Father spoke about the Son, the Holy Spirit were all there. All in one moment, 
signifying the power of the Trinity here. And there's three things that he says here to his son to make sure that I believe that every one of us need to have heard or hear and every child in our lives, especially dads, if you hear these things, you say these things to your kids, you will see the most amazing thing begin to transform in their lives. And three things that God did here to his son, he said this, you are my child, I love you, and I'm proud of you. God said to his son, you are my child, I love you, and I'm proud of you. And if they don't hear it, there's a void that creates in their life, and they will fill it with other things. If they don't hear this, now I don't know if Jesus didn't hear that, if he would have gone and filled it with other things. But the issue is this, is that God was saying here right now, three things, I love you, I'm proud of you, and you're my child. The three things that he said there. And God says, you're my son in whom I am well pleased. When God called Jesus his son, he gave him his identity. This is my son. That's who he is. He is my son. I identify with him and he identifies with me. He said to him, I love you. What did he give him? He valued him immediately. He said, number one, I identify with you and you with me. I love you and I give you the value of that love. He backed him up. So he gave him identity, value, and with him, I am well pleased. What did that bring? Confidence. All of a sudden, when I knew that my dad, I remember when I was a kid and I was swimming in this water hole and I found a net it was a net just sitting on the bottom of the, of the place I was swimming. And I went, oh, this is cool. And I was catching fish. And this bloke came up and grabbed me by the pants because I was about eight years old. Grabbed me by the pants, lifted me up out of the water and said, you little brat, you stole this from me. And I go, what? The next thing I know, I don't know where my dad was, but he came out of nowhere. And he said, oi! Just like that. And the bloke dropped me in the water. And he goes, your kid stole my... I said, I didn't, Dad. I said, I found it in the... And I literally, I had found it in the water. He'd lost it in a, the tide or something like that. Or maybe he was stealing it. But <laughs> anyway, I just remember he said, beside that, put him down and get away. And I handed him the, the net and he just walked away. I was confident that my dad backed me and I was valued by him because he raced to my side to say, I'm here, don't you worry, son, I got this. So God says to his son, I identify with you, I love you, and I give you confidence now because I am pleased with you. Remember when the disciples said to Jesus, they came to him and they said, teach us to pray. And he said, well, you can, okay, I can do that. He says, well, when you pray, say this, our Father. Now remember, it's not the Father like, Father, dear Father. Because when you hear that term in your voice, especially older people, oh, it's Father. I still meet old people now that when I have a cup of tea with them, they, they refer to their dad as Father. They go, oh, I was talking to Father, and I remember him telling me. That's not a relationship to me. That's, I don't know. That to me is like, hey, Dad, I was talking to my dad just recently. That's a relationship. And, and he said, when you pray, pray our Father. And now this blew their mind because remember, they knew him as God, the creator, as Elohim. And they knew him as Adonai, their master. They knew him in a way that wasn't intimate. They just knew that this God was amazingly powerful and could destroy anything. And then this guy, Jesus, comes along who declares to be his son and says, our Father, which translated is dad. It's the Abba one. Which is amazing. He go, they go on there, wait a minute. They're talking about this God. He's talking about this God and he's calling him Dad. A Father which art in heaven. These Jews who knew him as all that way is, and it's not that, that phony, that, that Father, I beseech thee. Because that conjures up so many other things in my mind. When I hear somebody say that about Father, I go, hmm, better be off. But this is a Father. Father, remember, he's looking at returning the hearts of the kids to the dads and no longer dread him. The interpretation of it was that this is a, 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 it's not a distant father, but a close and intimate relationship with a father who no longer is dreaded or been afraid to be in judgment of, but revere him as their reconciled and loving one. 
when you know him, you can go to him and say, hey, dad, I'm struggling with this. And even in this, if you're struggling with the whole father concept, you should be able to go to him now and you go, God, I know I should be talking to you like a father. I really find it hard. And this is why I find it hard. And the amazing thing, you know, like, I don't know if you ever had that family in your life where you thought, gee, I wish I had their parents. Nobody's going to nod in that one. But oftentimes, you know, I had friends that come to me, oh, gee, I wish I could live, be your family. And I would visit other friends and go, gee, I wish I could be in your family, just especially after your parents have disciplined you. Other families were always better, especially after the, the what was it, the rod of discipline was applied to the seat of learning. But everybody else's parents were better. But as I older I get, I, get, I began to realize how great God is and by putting us in the families that we have. And it doesn't mean that get it right and it doesn't mean that they're great at what they do, but they do try. And again, I will trace it back and say if your parents or your dad was one of those not a good person or did treated you, mistreated you, I'll guarantee we could trace it right back right through their generations. I'll guarantee it. Or something snapped somewhere in their life that they just didn't know what to handle and the best thing is to lash out at the ones that are closest to you. Doesn't excuse it, doesn't make it right. It just is the way it is. And to a world that says, when God says, I will bring the hearts of the fathers of the children, and if it doesn't happen, I will smite the land with a curse. In other words, we are given over to our own things. And look at what's happening in the earth today. We're, not, we're getting rid of authority. We're getting rid of the power of parents. They no longer have a place to say what is right about their children or anything like that. It's being removed left, right, and center. And God has told us what will happen. It will be smite. It'll, the earth will just be annihilated. You can see it happening. You can see what's going on. This is the scripture being personified. So many of us carry scars from the relationships. And when I call God Father, it doesn't only identify who he is. It also identifies who I am. I am a child of God. That's my identity. And that's what I want to talk to us about tonight is our identity. It's not my career or my relationship or the position that I hold anywhere. It's my life in God the Father. My identity isn't found in who I am. It is found in whose I am. My identity isn't found in who I am. I'm a pastor. I'm also a HR manager. But that is not my identity. My identity is that I am a child of God. My identity, as Mark was talking about tonight, their finances, their identity isn't their jobs and their supply. Their identity is that God is their father and that he will look after them. And it's the same in my world. It's the same in your world. The identity that you are, oh, I was a, a hardworking person. That's not your identity. Your identity is in God. My identity isn't that I'm a husband to Janine. My identity is that I'm a child of God and so is she. And together we are one, but he is our identity. You're his son, you're his daughter, he's saying this to you. He wants to speak to you into your heart today. He wants to give this into your heart that you are a child of God. That's your identity. When we don't know who we are, we begin to dress it up. Look at what's going on in the world today. I don't know who I am, we've made a decision. I'm not choosing what side of the fence I'm going to be. So we've lost our identity. We've got no identity, and so the world is just floating around. We're just choosing to not, but God has said, in me, you have all the identity, like he did with, this is my beloved son, his identity, whom I love, his value, in whom I am well pleased. He gave him everything that he needed. He gave him, he could absolutely be back to the hilt. He, was, he knew it. This is You are free to be you when you know you are loved and know that you're a child of the living God. When you are you, like I was talking to the church this morning, I am me. When I preach to people and get in front of people, I say stupid things sometimes. Sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cringe. And people look and go, did he really say that? Or did he not say that? But the thing is this, is that God has given me, and I find that the more I press into him, the more of who I am gets released. 
because of who we are. It, it, otherwise, we come and go, ooh, it's all very proper. <laughs> I'm in church now and I'm a Christian. People say often things, oh, you're a Christian, you shouldn't say that. How do you know what I should and shouldn't say? How do you know what, how I should and shouldn't act? Because the way, if you say, I'm born again and you're a believer, then you should act a certain way. Yeah, there should be things that we, that we should be known, but we should be known because, you see, when you identify with God the Father who is holy, righteous, full of joy, full of life, you should be going into that place. You shouldn't be the sourest person in the room. You should be the most amazingly happy person in the room because you are identifying with God the Father. You are identifying with him. You are his son. This is my son. This is my daughter in whom I love and am well pleased. Just the fact that we celebrated communion should be enough for us to be running around this room hooting and holler and go, woo I am a son. He died for me. He gave me all. Oh, but pastor, my problems. No, your problems come back to God. That's not your identity. Oh, we've been in the poor poverty line. We're 10th generation of taking the doll. Then be the first one to replant the tree and not do it because God is your identity. It's not the government. It's not the, you are not at the whim of everybody, that every decision that's made on your behalf. I'm not at the whim of the way the world wants to be right now. I am at the, 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 I am at the, uh, the, what God has got for me is I'm in him and he is in me and I am, have a destiny in God. I know who I am. I am a son of the living God. That's who I am. You know, you're known and you're loved by your father. It's not about your earthly dad anymore. It's about your heavenly father. That's who I identify with. My earthly dad, he is an, was an amazing man, but the thing is, is that he is not the one that I find my identity in. I just carry his name, but now I carry a greater name, the name of God, the name of the Father. You just think about Jesus in this way. People said he was mad. People said he was a phony. They said he had demons, and they even said he was a demon. That's what they said to him. It never shook Jesus at all because he knew who he was. You think about it. It never shook him. Never shook him when they said, they called him Beelzebub. It never shook him. He just came back with an answer. It never moved him. But what about us? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will ever. That's the biggest lie we've ever heard. I'd rather patch up a stick and a stone damage than names any day. But it's true that, you know, they called him all these things, but Jesus was never affected by it. It never shook him. And when you know who you are, it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what people say about the church because we are identified with God. And if we're walking in his way and we ident- get this, if we identify with him, we will be people that will be persecuted. But the issue is this, we're not persecuted because we're standing out there yelling that if they don't turn, they're going to go to hell. We're standing out there bringing the love of God to a place and genuinely people don't know how to receive love. And so the best way to get it is persecute it. But the minute we turn around and start flogging the Bible over their heads and start doing all those things, it doesn't work. But the minute we get out there and love and love and pour out the love of God like nothing, like nothing else, that when people slap you, we get back up and we go, you know what, that my identity isn't even in that. See, missionaries, their identity isn't being a missionary. Their, mission, their identity is, I am sent by God. I am, he said, this is my beloved son. When Pastor Mark and Kylie came down here, they, this is their beloved son and daughter in whom I am well pleased. He gives them value. He gives you value. If you're going, if you've got an un- safe partner you are still a child of God and he loves that partner but that person doesn't affect you because you are a child of the living God when you know you're loved you have a sense of value with you I am well pleased and it gives you a confidence when you dad when your dad says it oh, when your dad says good job when COVID broke out and we were recording all the video all the messages and putting it up one of the things I discovered was that my dad was watching it. And how I knew that was that I would read these random texts. Good job, son. Proud of you. 
next week a phone call. Good job, bud. That's all it was. Nothing big. Just good job. Proud of you. And you go, wow, my dad. My dad was affirming me. It gave me confidence. It really didn't matter whether I thought it was a good sermon anymore. It didn't matter whether somebody said to me, oh, missed it a bit. It didn't matter anymore because my dad would just ring. He, I don't know if they were good or not. But he rang me and said, son, great job. Love what you're doing. It didn't matter what anyone else said. And it's the same in this world today when God's doing something in our lives and we're walking, you know, we take too much on board by what other people say. You just have to read the Facebook comments to see how much we take, how quickly we take on board what people say. It doesn't, not even relevant. People don't need, it do, you don't need to take it on board. It's when God addresses the situation, that's when you, would, you, you take it on board. And he'll do it. Oh, don't worry, he'll do it. Because that's what a loving dad does. He doesn't leave you to your own device. He says, come on in. I, I, I want to affirm you. I want to give you a confidence that when you go out, you know I'm with you. It doesn't matter who you are. There's something about being affirmed by your dad. Dad, I just told you about that. Reading my notes just rolled back the wrong way. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. Proud of you is enough. Every kid should hear this. You know, when my son was going through his hard times, I had to find Janine and I. Janine would say, "Son, we've got to find something. And so I'd talk to him and say, mate, I said, I'm just so really proud about this. And in a little while, I knew what was going on in the other part of his life. But the interesting thing is he said recently, he said, Dad, it was all those little things that he used to say, that little, I knew I could call you any time of the day. I knew it. You know, I thought, God... Thank you for giving me the grace to do that. You know, and I look at this conversation and I look at people and I look at folks in the world today. And this room, I would be foolish to think that no, you've all got this perfect relationship with your, your parents. Because I don't think you do. And I can't tell by looking around the room. But in this room, statistically, at least one of you should be squirming. Or uncomfortable because you think oh, I can't do this that's okay I want you to know that this is a loving God before when I said I don't want to be you know I wish I had a family like that you see that comes from this place of where you can start to go God you have a family like that it's that family that I said up in Townsville this morning, I said, you know, think of that family that you just thought was the most amazing family. Multiply it by 100,000 times and you might get close to the love that God has for you. It's an absolutely incredible time. And, you know, I don't for one minute um, think lightly of this message. I, th I know this very much is that God loves you. And when you're praying at night and when you're asking God, you say, God, I don't know how to do this because I, you know that I had a bad relationship with my dad or my dad was this or my mum was this or whatever. I need you. This is all the prayer has to be. I need you to help me. And guess what? He will. And it won't, might not be the way I think Mark or Pastor Kylie or Mark said it before. That it, it might not come the way that we think, but he will help. And every time that thought comes up, I was saying up home this morning, I said, every time that thought comes and goes, oh, this, I'm just saying I can't get out of it. Oh, sorry, God. You're my father. And you've got the best for me. When we come to him, he gives us identity. It says in John 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. And even to those who believe in his name, who were, not, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He said, I gave them the right to become the children of God. Every person you know, every person in your life has the right to become the children of a child of God has the right right now, you, even you, come into that place and you go, God, I am your child. And I don't know how to handle some things, but you do. Maybe you've got kids and you're going, I just don't know how to handle. Uh. 
You want to slam them. I get it. I live with grandchildren. I get it. Let's just close the door and lock it so it's quiet. Remember Maxwell Smart's cone of silence? I would love one of those sometimes. But then I think about it later and I think, God, what a privilege to have this. Because one day it won't be there. And it will just be Dave and Mabel sitting at the tea table. But right now it's not. And I come to this place and every, they have every right to be my child. And I will accept them and defend them and, and give them what they need to be healthy, young people of God. Some of us have amazing families and others of us, it's quite painful when we think about our families. I find that out really easily at Christmas time. I mean, that's so easy to pick people who had great families at, Chris, at Christmas time. What are you doing? Oh, spend it with a family. <sighs> I hate this young lady. We had a lady, I asked a lady at our work the other, last year, I said, would you do up the Christmas stuff? Oh, she said, I hate Christmas, but I'll do it. So we had a Grinch Christmas. She actually did it up. She made a big thing about the Grinch Christmas. She made a Grinch Christmas tree. It looked amazing. I was like amazed by it. So I made this big deal about the Grinch Christmas and everybody at work came and looked at the Grinch Christmas and everyone, Merry Christmas. And then, you know, it didn't, what didn't affect us to be Grinchy. And I found out later that there was a reason behind it, a real tragedy that happened and the Christmas doesn't, why it meant that way. I get the whole Grinch thing. And I even get why she did it. And why would I stand back and go, oh, that's, I'll never ask her again. I would ask her again. Maybe it was cathartic. Maybe it helped her. Because everybody started going, love the Christmas decoration. Green and black. Interesting. But I've never seen it happen before. She did a good job. But in and through and above it all, you are a child of the living God. It gives you an identity. You have value and your love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish. If you're, never, if, you can, if you're ever wondering, am I actually valued? Think of the cross. Does God value me? Think of the cross. Think of what he did for us. That's the price that was paid for your soul. You're loved and there's a confidence that comes with that. When everything comes against you, when everything wants to shut you down, you can be confident that God's saying, you are my beloved son and you I'm well pleased. Jesus said when he was going back to the Father, see, we're not alone. He went back and he said, I'm going back because I can't do everything you need me to do. But I'm going to send another. Dad's going to send another called the Holy Spirit. And he's going to come and he's going to cheer you on. He's going to be with you everywhere, every time of the day. He's never going to leave you. He's going to follow you around like a little puppy. And he's going to get you where you need to be cheering you on. You know, like a puppy. Just, just come on, let's play. We can do this. That's, that's our Holy Ghost. He's out there. Let's do this. He's a really big puppy. But you've got to be careful. A bit like um, Clifford, you know, the big red dog. That's how, whoa, whoa, let's play. Let's get this going. And every day you can do this, and I'm with you, and I'm on your side. See, we need families to be healed. See, God's going to move in the church first. And if you're struggling in this way, you come to him daily, and you say, God, it's a struggle for me, and I thank you for my family, and I thank you today that you are going to help me. I want to be that person. I want to be, see, I want to be that dad. I want to be that one that my kids know that I'm proud of them. I want to be that one because I want to see society change. And even this morning at the, in the Townsville Church, I had men coming up to me afterwards and saying, I feel really passionate about dads and, I, I, you know, this is God's been stirring me. And I'm thinking, God, you're doing something here. Continue to do it. We have a God who restores. We have a God who restores people. He can restore you immediately. He can restore it over time. As Pastor Mark said earlier, he said it might be a bit slow. It might be quick. It might Wherever it is, we'd love it to be quick, but sometimes it needs to be slow. Sometimes it needs to be quick. Whatever it needs to be, we will work with him because he is with us because he's a God who restores, and that's what he does. He, God seems to always start in the church, though, because remember, if he's going to do something out there, he's going to do it here first because he needs us to be the leaders in it. He needs us to show the way. And this, I know for some, is going to be big and huge because he's going to ask you to lay it down. 
He's going to say, I'll walk with you in this. I'll come with you because we don't want to walk with a limp anymore. We want to run. I don't want to walk with a limp because of that. You see, my, I said before, my life has changed because my dad made a decision that changed our lives. My dad grew up in a family that was, that was disjointed. He had a dad that was home but not, not home. He was home but not present. You know what I mean? He never spoke. My mum loved him. My mum said that his, my dad's dad was a, a beautiful man, but he didn't speak very much at all. But when he did speak, you listened. And she said whenever she took us over, he died when I was about, I think he died, when, must have been when I was not long born and died at 53. But he, she used to take my sisters over there who are twins. And he said that he just lit up the minute he saw and he would be the totally different person. And uh, when he died, the family sort of went in a weird way and, and dad grew up and dad became like one of the kids that we are uh, experiencing today. He didn't steal stuff, but he got out drunk and being a, a rebel rouser. He would go to youth camps for the church and end up on the Talabudgera Creek down the Gold Coast and he would be drunk down on the riverbanks and stuff like that in the creek. And uh, then in 1956, he was out one night and he got invited to a Billy Graham crusade. And he made a decision to give his life to Christ. My mum liked him all the time because he was a bad boy. That tells you a lot about my mum. And, um, you know, because he was a bad boy. And so she, it was, she was always in trouble from her mum. And uh, they went out. And, but he was, she knew that this, he was just a bad person. They went to a Baptist church. So he grew up in the church but just had no relationship with God. Went and heard Billy Graham gave his life to Christ. And that night changed our family forever. Because I don't know what would have happened if he didn't. But I don't have to know what happened because I know what he did. And when we stood on, his pl on the platform at his funeral, I had a, wanted to have a photo because we had the photo of all the grandchildren and children, great-grandchildren and uncle and niece, uh, sorry, and daughters and son standing on the stage all together. He always wondered at the end of his life, he said, I wonder if I've been a good dad and a good granddad. And I remember standing up there, and the people that would have known him as a young man, some of them were at the funeral. I wonder what they thought about this man who had a great legacy. When people were saying, Papa taught me, Pop, Pop taught me how to love Jesus and love people. It was the common thread that came through, how to love God and love people. And I thought to myself, that was the greatest legacy he could have ever left us, was the one that says, hey, I'm proud of your son. And that's what God the Father wants to do in restoring to us the things. If you didn't receive it from an earthly father, I'm here today to tell you that the heavenly Father wants to come to you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Because the interesting thing in Luke chapter 4, the very next chapter when Jesus returned, and I close with this, Jesus returned after going out into the wilderness and he came back and he went to the temple and he said this, that I have come to heal the broken, the brokenhearted. That's why Jesus came back. And so today, as I'm just going to pray, and I'm going to ask God to touch you in this room. And if you would like prayer, please come out. I'll love to pray with you. But tonight, maybe you're sitting there and you're going, you know what, I know that my relationship was not that good. But I want to tell you again, I reiterate coming back to the beginning, that God wants to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And when he's doing that, he's going to start here. You see, because the end of the day, Jesus and the Holy Spirit both are here to point us to the Father. You've got to think about this, that the, the Holy Spirit, everything that Jesus and the Holy Spirit do is to glorify the Father. Why is, that? Why is that? Because he loves us. His love is for us. Why would he give us Jesus and the Holy Spirit? Because he wants to show us an incredible love. And tonight, as you sit there in your seat, I ask that you would reflect on a moment and just say, God, maybe you had the best relationship with your dad. Maybe it was outstanding. Maybe it was just 
the most, the most thing that you dreaded was coming home from school or coming home when he came home or your mum came home or whether it was your parents or not, whatever it was. I just want to say to you right now, hey God, I know that this is going to be a difficult journey, but I want you with me all the way. And I know you're with me. I pray, Lord, that you would just melt our hearts tonight. God, for those of us that are struggling, I pray for your love right now. I just see somebody here and you're like a, 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 like a two-year-old walking around and, and, and you feel it's like a lonely two-year-old. And I just see right now the hand of God coming and grabbing you by the hand. And it's like a sense of, of, of mm, everything's okay. It wasn't, but now it is. And God wants to walk with you. He wants to walk with you. He's just there right now. He's right in this room right now. Just his love and his peace. Don't rush through the moment. Don't speed yourself up and go, oh, let's just move and have a cup of tea. But God is a God of restoration. Maybe they're gone and there's, you know, and there's a lot of angst there that will hurt and there's nothing that can be done. But there is. Right now, the love of God. The love of God. Breaking down every barrier, breaking down every wall. Thank you, Jesus. He came to heal the brokenhearted. That's what he came for. Right now. Father, I lift every life to you in this room. As you restore things. Or God, as you enhance things. Maybe, God, the things are just so good and you're breathing more. Father, let us be vessels that others will look at and go, that's, that's what I long for. Father, those of us that have been fatherless or parentless in our life, but God, that we would experience such an incredible love of the Father. That when people look at us and go, how could you possibly be like that? Because I've experienced, I've found my identity. i found my value. i found it in my place today. That's who I am. Be the things that he's asked of us. God, I thank you for that tonight. Minister. Minister life into every person. Father, the people in this room are your child. You love them. And you're proud of them. God, no matter what comes against us, we can say that you are my dad. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.